Good evening, everyone. Good that you're watching and a very warm welcome for the people here. Good that you're here in the Bali tonight. My name is Zara Toxus and I will moderate this evening, turning against Orban, how to fight authoritarianism. And tonight is the last night of our Freidenkers Festival. And this year the theme is Amsterdam, queer capital of the world, with a question mark. As we find ourselves in a climate where progressive values are very much under pressure, we also have to look at other states in Europe. And this is why we'll have invited Shuja Zeleny to give a freedom lecture here tonight. And afterwards, she will be discussing uh, what's been said with Kati Piri, Dutch politician for GroenLinks uh, P van de A. But first, let me introduce to you Shuja Zeleny. She is a Hungarian author, a former politician and a foreign policy expert. And she is the director of the Democracy Institute Leadership Academy for Central and Eastern Europe. And it's part of the Central European University against which Orban has been actively campaigning. Her book, Taint Democracy, Victor, Victor Orban and the Subver Subversion of Hungary, was published last year. And Shuja served as a member of the parliament from the 1990s to 1994 uh, as a member for Fidesz. And yes, that's Orban's party. And from 2014 to 2018, 18, she served for EGYUT, if this is the right pronunciation, uh, a party that was formed out of a social liberal alliance to fight against Orban. And we've asked Zuzia to give uh, a lecture on freedom, so please give her a warm applause. Thank you very much, Sarah. It's really wonderful to be here. Um, when I was invited to talk to you, I, I really was thrilled by the idea of three thinkers. Um, it reminded me to uh, the time of the 1980s. Most of you don't even remember that. Uh, this was Hungary still under the communist dominance. And the official theory uh, of, the, of the Central Communist Party was that intellectual activities and artistic activities were either supported when they somehow cooperated with the, uh, represented the ideology of the ruling uh, party, or tolerated or banned. Now, um, thinking was tolerated. It's, it's possible, it's, it's impossible to, you know, to shut everyone's up, right? Our mind is, is vivid, so obviously we all think. Uh, it was uh, supported until it w had no influence. So that was very important for the regime. People just think whatever you want, but you don't make any larger influence. So there were, and this was a kind of other notion in the late 80s in Hungary, the small circles of freedom, basically around the table like this, when like three, five, ten people could sit, talk, and think freely until they remained in the room. So now it's very interesting. Of course, no one in the 1980s had any idea what would come later. But these uh, free thinking groups actually become the, uh, the base of a new democratic regime in Hungary a couple of days later. Because of course, in order to make democracy, you need to think freely, and you also have to talk to other people freely. So. Um, Small circles of freedom are, may not look very efficient, but actually there are historic moments when they become really very, very important. So um, I would like to ask you for a minute to stop and think about what freedom means for you. Maybe you put it in your phone or just you try to compose one sentence. These are the photos I took from the Google. So if you write freedom, you get photos like this. Is it reasonable, right? I think, but I can have a few seconds to stop speaking so that you can think about what freedom means for you. And then, this is Viktor Orban's Twitter account. So he also thinks he is uh, for freedom. Actually, he's fighting for freedom. So. Is it similar to 
what you thought about like one minute ago? Does it fit to your, whatever you know of Orban? I mean, you've definitely heard his name. Is, is this kind of, you know, similar to what, how you define freedom for yourself? What well, there are some people who do believe it's similar. Okay, but maybe maybe not everyone. It's at least it's kind of you know disturbing or it, let's call it interesting. So he's definitely a freedom fighter. So why is it and why so many people are actually see him as a freedom fighter when I do see him an autocrat, actually a growing autocrat, and many other people see him as an autocrat and definitely not someone who is fighting for freedom. So now, obviously, Orban has a story. And this story is also my story, because uh, in 1988, the f young group Fides came out of the small circles of freedom as a university student, established a youth organization, which is called Fides. It's Federation of Young Democrats. Fides means actually fidelity. It's a, it's a Latin word. It's really very nicely composed. And this is us. Uh, in 1988, uh, running, campaigning internally in the youth group for who, who would compose uh, the, the, the group's kind of leadership. So this was our campa campaign moment from our first Congress. You can see I'm the only woman there. <laughs> and the text, it's, it's also very super cool. Uh, it's, I don't know if anyone understands Hungarian, but it says that we want to live in a country where the law protects not only Coca-Cola, because Coca-Cola in the 80s was a very Western thing, and it was written that it's protected by law. But of course, we didn't have any freedom rights. There were no rights as such spoken about at all. So this was, it was Fidesz. It was really very, very cool. It was when it was established, it was growing and growing very quickly every week. And this become uh, in a one, uh, so that's the Fidesz manifesto from 1988. You can see what we were fighting for. It's the respect for human rights. I'm just repeating, it's 88. So it was far before the Berlin Wall was fallen. So it's human rights, it's liberalization of economy. We actually use the term market economy, multi-party elections, academic freedom, introduction of civil service in the compulsory black, uh, black, uh, military service. So military service for men were obligatory at that time. And we were fighting for that some people who had conscientious objectors, they could go to civil service. Um, and, and we also had a very strong um, green agenda point because there was a big um, dam, water dam uh, under planning on the Danube River, which is actually very flat there. So it was meant that, that they build a very high mountain uh, on the Danube in the, on the border of Slovakia and Hungary, back then Czechoslovakia. Uh, but this was also uh, a horrible construct and, and also a serious threat on the ecology of the river Danube. So this was Fides in 1988. So we were doing all the things what a young movement is doing, uh, community building, talking, uh, mobilizing. These are all kind of, uh, I, that's my archive, so I'm sorry, but it's, uh, with me about everything, but of course many, many more people were all kind of sittings and demonstrations. We spent most of the time on the street, whether it was summer or winter, and of course that's also uh, uh, the young Orban and, and the other guy with the mustache, he's now the head of the Speaker of the Parliament, uh, kind of nonsense uh, person, but well, he was still a fine person back then. <laughs> so, and then in Hungary, most people do not remember because, again, this was before the Berlin Wall, but the big uh, cathartic moment of the transition in Hungary has happened in June 1989. Uh, and this was a reburial of the heroes of the 1956 revolution. So the, uh, the most important uh, iconic um, moment in Hungary's history, which we were referring ourselves, was the freedom fight of 1956, which was obviously uh, followed by communist rule, and it was not possible to talk about when I grew up. So that was a big, big moment when actually the still uh, communist party on rule and the democratic opposition which was composed of many other similar groups than Fidesz. We just 
we were the young one, but there were other groups formulating in that period, other small circles of freedom. Then uh, we actually could pressure uh, the government to do this thing, uh, this, this big celebratory moment. And there were Viktor Orban, who gave a speech uh, in the name of the young Hungarians. It was not even Fidesz, but young Hungarian. And uh, he gave a speech that everyone today in Hungary remembers because he, sped the unsp he spoke the unspokable. He said in the speech that, or in the speech, that uh, Russian tr it's time for the Russian troops to, to leave the country. So basically what he said was something much more radical than any other speakers uh, uh, spoke there who were more commemorial. Uh, to the title victims of the of the 1956 revolution. So that was a very political speech. It demonstrate how political Fidesz was actually, and how used how we used this big event for for speaking something very special and politically important. So in 1989, freedom for us was individual freedom rights, but it was also national independence. And this is very important uh, you to learn that it was all for the Eastern uh, countries. So when we speak about freedom, it's there that this is freedom from some kind of foreign dominance. And this is true for all the Eastern countries because the Soviet dominance was a last in our history, but there were many other dominance, which, uh, obviously Russia, from Germany, from the Habsburgs, from the Ottomans. So we all have uh, hundreds of years under various kind of dominance. So this is an important element of our concept of freedom. It's much more than uh, our individual freedom rights. And Fidesz and most of the Hungarian opposition in 89 did both of this together uh, back then. So then it was the, the Berlin Wall was fallen down just a couple of months later. Everything quickly has changed. And actually Hungary, which was one of the first, I mean, Poland was also kind of forward looking. So Hungary and Poland was the first to push their own governments to make some reform. But after the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall, the whole region was just over of communism as it's, it's now history. So Hungary for many years uh, become the poster child of democratic transition. We did everything so well uh, we had the first fully uh, free elections. Uh, it was a time when we, uh, with our youth organization, actually entered politics at a very early age. Uh, we had a relatively stable party system. So at each election, every four years, there was another alternating uh, party or party coalition, which demonstrate it's a kind of measurement of, of a stable party system. Economic stabilization happened in a first decade, let's say. Media environment, there were huge debate about the role of the media, what free media uh, uh, means, uh, and this, is, this was heavily contested. There were big fights against it. every Eastern European country what free media is actually about, because there were some politicians, very or rightly so, who said, okay, the media's role is to support the democratic transition, meaning they should support the government. So, and there were huge debate about this. Uh, but over the la end of the la first decade, it was pretty balanced. And then uh, Hungary was economically catching up to the West, which was the historic aim of the whole transition to catch up to the West so that we become like Austria, like Germany. I think we did not really want it to be like the Netherlands because we didn't know much enough. And then you were so free that that was a bit difficult to imagine, but anyway, most Hungarians went to Austria and few of them went to Amsterdam. Only young people went to Amsterdam, so we all did so, but most Hungarians went to Austria, so actually somehow the catching up the West meant that we would be like Austria. And then I have to tell that Austria is one of the richest, if not the richest country in Europe probably the second most rich after Luxembourg, even richer by per capita than, than the Netherlands. So that was not a very easy uh, agenda, but anyway, that's what Hungarians had in their mind. So it was the sky was the limit, and especially to my generation, who were in their 20s and early 30s, and it was really how we got adults. So was it the same for everyone? 
Well, we thought yes, but then later we learned this was not exactly the came, case. Well, Hungarian and all, every other country's Eastern European economies collapsed completely from one day to another. Big factories were closed because they were not at all competitive. They were um, only able to work within the socialist uh, economic system. It was centrally planned. It was completely um, um, not worth to, to maintain because their achievement was just absolutely not very productive. But this meant that thousands and thousands of people lost their job very suddenly. Hun probably millions, in, if we see the whole region, millions of families' life was completely shaken from, from one month to the other. And the whole idea of this democratization, which we thought is so fabulous, actually was very difficult to adjust. And I can tell that my own parents, who were young people in 56, and they really had the idea of freedom in their heart, and they were super happy. They also were struggling how to adapt to this new situation, because it was all about competition, democratic competition in politics and economics. Everything became uh, very, very different as as earlier. So, so this was not also a generation question, as also um, certain region of Hungary, which were more industrial, absolutely collapsed. So there was huge and very difficult changes. And I have to tell that most of the political elite had no idea what to do with this, because we were so happy uh, having uh, our double freedom, individual freedom, which we put into our constitution, and also the freedom from the Soviet Union. So we thought, OK, there are high price, but that's worse for the betterment of the country. It's worse for the long term, uh, for the long term stability to become like Austria, to achieve uh, the fabulous European Union as soon as possible. So actually, this happened 15 years later. So Hungary and other 10 countries joined the EU in 2004. For many of us, it was too late. We wanted to get there you know, in 1993. In Fidesz's first program, not the manifesto, but the first program, I think we had the 19, 1993 as a deadline. And we had joining the euro right after the you know, euro was introduced. So Hungary is still not part of the eurozone. Um, but, but there was already a kind of transition fatigue by 2004. So did we celebrate it? Yeah, we did so because my generation were all the, you know, the benefiter of this whole transition. But now we know, looking back, that not everyone was so happy. Because uh, also being in the European Union meant more competition. Small Eastern European companies, agriculture companies, uh, other kind of companies had to compete for the single market. Uh, rightly with the very uh, capital-rich Western companies, and many of them failed. It's still, they are still, few of them are actually uh, uh, very competitive. Uh, Hungary's uh, fabulous economic uh, advance uh, compared to the other countries were absolutely vanished by, by this time. There become corruption. I mean, there was corruption before, but the European Union, free money, it's incredible amount of free money, created a even more corruption, because this meant that all political elites, various parties, thought, OK, so we, have, we are building even more roads, because building roads is the, the absolute fabulous moment for, for corruption. You can build roads for any price. Uh, so there was, and of the EU wanted us to build roads. So we built a lot of roads. Uh, I have no idea how much money was taken out of it. But all political parties were also uh, competing for corruption. And this, is, this become, so this really was not a plan, you know, that with the EU accession, we would be higher, we would be more corrupt than before. It was really very su big surprise to all of us. We are still struggling. Maybe we can speak later about this. So it all came with the EU membership. And of course, a lot of people start left to the West to work. A lot of young people, everyone with highly skilled job. Hungary specifically lost a very highly skilled workforce. Other countries, there were some different profile, but, but uh, Hungarians left uh, who were very well skilled. So we, hung, we, the Hungarian state, trained 
thousands and tens, ten thousands of doctors and university students and, and all kind of very important jobs who then quickly left uh, to the Western countries uh, to work. And uh, very soon after 2004, when we entered all the decision-making bodies and the, the various uh, uh, joint program of the EU, people faced that, okay, we go working there, but is it okay that we get like 20% less if we are doctors? Are we worse doctors than the Dutch doctors? So a lot of people met with this being the second class citizens of the European Union. And these all things had very serious consequences and a lot of things that we absolutely were not prepared for. There was this victimhood mentality. So now we are again there as second class citizens. So who is, there, who is responsible for? Well, obviously the West. I don't know whether this resonates to you on these days, but this, is, this, this has an origin. Obviously, I had to learn how it works because I have completely different perceptions of the whole process. Because I, uh, I represented someone who was the beneficiary of, of, the, of the European accession. And of course, there are many Hungarians who benefited a lot because, of course, a lot of money which we received was, was spent very well. Not all of them was stolen. And of course, the free traveling and free work created incredible situation and f fantastic prospects for many Hungarians. But there were another many for whom this was not such a big fun. So what happened at the same time in the world? In, we are in the 2000s. And this is uh, how the BRICS countries, like uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and then later uh, South Africa, started really to grow. And it's until 2010, uh, the uh, GDP, the global GDP production of these five countries reached basically the uh, the level of the, the richest countries of the world. So there was an incredible development. We can, you know about this, so I, I've just brought this to remind our, ourselves that at the same time, the world has significantly changed. Globalization reached its peak around the, the, the turn of the, uh, of the century. So a lot of other countries were actually doing pretty well. Poverty in the world decreased significantly, the entire population grew out of poverty. So the, what we call today the global south, the developed world was, were developing increasingly. So what did it mean for uh, like very smart European politicians who were happy within the EU, but who were also a bit of a victimized by being second class citizens. So we had one of them, Fortunately, Viktor Orban, who was by, t by that time for 20 uh, years in politics, because he started in 1988. He was once already a prime minister. He was actually running Hungary rather uh, successfully. Still, uh, Fidesz lost the election in 2002. But during the 2000, uh, he was figuring out how the world is moving. And he realized that there are other things good in the world and other regions emerging as very um, powerful uh, regions than the European Union and the West. So when he came to power in 2010, with a lot of luck, I would say, but also with some talent, he created, he decided to change uh, the turn of, of Hungary's future. And he introduced a new experiment which he called illiberalism. He actually called it illiberal democracy. It's highly contested whether anything like this happening. I do contest that illiberal cannot be democratic, but this is, uh, it's not a political science discussion at this moment. So he called it uh, illiberal democracy, which is co something completely new. A country which is rather stable democracy. I have to say that he got a super majority in 2010, which means that his one party out of six in parliament had not only the governing majority, but a super majority, 67% of the, of the mandates, which made him possible that change the constitution, one party. I mean, you can imagine 
you are in the Netherlands, you cannot even imagine a one-party government. You, it's good for you. Be happy with this, because a one-party government is much worse than a multi-party confused coalition, I have to tell you. But that's, again, maybe something we can discuss later. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's practically an autocratization process, what we are witnessing in Hungary for 13 years now. And the essence of this is uh, that it's changing the rules. But the idea is that the West may not be the best ever type of word or, or, or life. So maybe there are other ways, like China, with everything but democracy, which is also able to create very disciplined economic growth and also an incredible well-being for its people. So now I think it's not such a new idea, but in 2010, I think Orban was the first who openly talked about that the West is declining. We do not want to decline, we Hungarians. So we better look for someone or some other model or we just experimenting ourselves. It's a small country. I mean, 10 million, you are approximately the same. You are a bit more. Hungary is very centralized, traditionally. He had constitutional majority. So why not experiment with something really new and with something which makes him remain Hungary's leader as long as possible? So, but the, que the que thing that he questioned, the relevance of liberal democracy for the betterment of people, this was something uh, quite extraordinary. And I have to tell you that for many years, uh, no one in Europe understood how serious this was. So slowly, slowly, anti-system radical parties started to emerge all around in Europe. Uh, until now, uh, in most other countries, they did not reach a critical mass. So very few countries, or no countries are still led by this kind of uh, parties. Uh, Fidesz doesn't look like this. Fidesz, for many Hungarians, looks a very decent party because, because Orban never uses um, violence. He doesn't need to. He has a majority and he just changes the rule. He, uh, he changes uh, first, first the, um, the election rules so that no other parties can really compete uh, fairly. Uh, the media law, the um, start to push some pressure on, on uh, judiciary in, uh, independence. So there, there is a whole playbook of what to change, and Hungary demonstrates all of them. So a lot of things we've been witnessing uh, ever since. So if you uh, remember Orban won in 2010, so that was two years after the economic crisis of 2008. This was... We didn't know back then, but now, of course, we know that this was a huge uh, turn in, uh, in the Western world's uh, history. Uh, it was a game changer. Uh, we are still analyzing what it brought up, but it definitely changed the political arena, and this started in Hungary. Of course, we, we started to be really worried about the climate change, migration crisis in 2015, and especially Brexit and Trump's uh, election as US president become finally the point when most people in the West understood that there is a big problem here. We knew it much earlier, but until then Hungary was looked like an isolated case. It's a small country, there is this crazy but smart person, so that's not something uh, much to worry about. And this is how the European Union managed the Hungary case, despite there was quite a lot of information, especially in the European Parliament. There were debates about Hungary, but it never went uh, into broader uh, decision-making processes because it was looked at something special and, and uh, not very important. So that definitely changed in 2016. Uh, the United States could elect someone like Trump. It was really a shocking experience, also Brexit for Europe. So I think since then there is a serious uh, I think European political elites now are completely aware of what is coming or what is there or what kind of problems we are witnessing. So, of course, uh, crises uh, 
are coming ever since. And we have COVID, we all had COVID, we all have Russia attack Ukraine. So we had new and new type of crisis. Uh, it's uh, global, it's and everything has global impact in these days. So uh, the consequences of instability, because obviously crisis brings instability, is, uh, is an illiberal counter-revolution. There are more and more political forces. We, let's call it easily populist. However, it's, it's more complex than that. But just to be able to talk easily, we call it populist. You also have populist parties, not only now, but years ago. Uh, so, who basically use existential fear of people and mobilize them for basically for power purposes. Because no populist know better what to do to save people from instability than, uh, than the populist. So no one knows. No one knows the future. No political leader. We are really quite helpless and we have to really think about that. So anyone who promise today that they know the magic formula are lying. There is pernicious polarization, very toxic communication in the political arena. It's, it's horrible in Hungary and in many other countries. It is, you also have the tone of the political language is changing. When it's changing and then it started to be polarizing and when one party is looking for others not like um, debate partners or rivals, but enemies, then there is a problem. Because if someone is not your rival but an enemy, then you have to get rid of them. You have to eliminate them. You have to fight against them. We fight against the enemy. We don't fight against the rival. So this is a big, big difference. And when the political tone, this is actually how it started in Hungary way before Orban won in 2010. In the 2006, already there was a toxic, toxic language. This was how Orban built up his populist, uh, populist support. That he, he named, it pointed at his enemies and mobilized people to get rid of them, really emotional way. By now, we, it's completely, it's a, it's, there is a pure culture war. They even call it as culture war. And what is the element of this culture war, which is against the, the, the Western liberal elite, are, are the same everywhere. This is anti-migration. It's, again, the gender ideology, whatever it means. It's a lot of things. It's basically against, uh, again, it's anti-Western. It's very anti-liberal uh, because it is against a single enemy. It always uses the us versus uh, them uh, talk and language. There is no any other, there's no difference. Either you are with me or you are my enemy. So this is, this is how uh, the political language is evolving in these days in Europe. I'm pretty sure Kadi can talk a lot about this because this is also happening in the European Parliament. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are the charismatic strongmen. Orban is definitely one of them who are there and say that we are here to save you in this horrible new world. So this is happening also at, at the international level, but interestingly, not necessarily among countries. So it's uh, the new division of Europe is not either between the West or the East, because Orban is the most European politician, according to his narratives. He is better European than we all here in this room, because he is protecting the real original Christian Europe against all kind of enemies. So he is the good European. So there's not, he's not anti-European. He is a better European than other Europeans. So the front line is within the EU. It's political. It's not by countries. It's, it's not even, it's more ideologic. This is kind of more, they, as Orban says, sovereignist, which is, which who want more nation state and the Federalist, but obviously he is not a very sovereignist. It's only a cover story. He is basically an autocrat. So it's an ideological, it's an ideological division and it is happening within countries. So I don't know much enough. And of course you are one of the freest country in Europe, 
but maybe bits and pieces you can also identify in some of the political groups in the Netherlands. I already talk, talked about the illiberal practices. The essence of this, that when you get to power, you change the rules of the games. So it's not democratic or not as democratic any longer. Uh, what is very interesting, Hungary is, is a captured state by now after 13 years. So we, uh, we have all these issues, all the elements of, uh, of the illiberal state because Orban announced that he's actually building an illiberal state, so he doesn't even make a secret about this. But pieces of this are happening in every European countries. And moments like the pandemic, for example, when there was an emergency state in each European state, now there is a, a lot of knowledge and study about that uh, most of the European governments did not go after the emergency state back to the previous status quo, but they had here or there a little bit more power for the government. So they're, they're in the media regulations or the judiciary or just a bit more uh, opportunity for government uh, to um, a larger spectrum of decisions to make by order, less to discuss with the parliament. There are plenty of little bits and pieces, and this is what is the new essence of illiberalism. This is why it's not dictatorship. This is not why it's not like it was 100 years ago, because it happens bits and pieces. So Hungary, uh, five years ago, was not that autocratic as it is today. And 10 years ago was not as autocratic than five years ago. It's changing continually by little bits of pieces. And this is, it's, it makes it very difficult to fight against because there's no violence. No one is in prison. No, no journalists are, are punished. But there are lots of lots of tiny little um, rules which all together create an environment that actually free speech is limited and opposition is regarded as an enemy, and uh, judges are under influence to uh, support governing uh, government, and state institutions do not investigate the government, which is incredibly corrupt. So here we are now. It's last year. This is the uh, conservative uh, action uh, conference, uh, political action conference from uh, the United States. This was actually in Hungary because now these conservative ac uh, political action conferences which are there in the United States and typically represent the absolute far right of the, of the Republican uh, intellectuals or politicians, I would say more politicians than intellectuals. No, Hungary is organizing uh, CPAC conferences. We are gathering the far right of the world into Hungary, who look at Viktor Orban as their hero. Why? Not because he is so good looking, but because he managed to capture the country. And this is really something. A lot of people like him because he is so strong and he is so powerful. And lots of people would like to be so strong and powerful. Lots of politicians all around the world well, most of them will never be as strong as Orban because, I mean, he is, he's a, actually a quite an unfortunate person because it's only 10 million people. So it would be much better if Hungary would be like 100 million people, then, then his weight would be really something. But he's 10 million, and it's spectacular how big influence this man can make in the world and how many American people from the far right are floating to Hungary and studying Viktor Orban's uh, magic. And the magic is nothing else, but once in life, he got 52% of the votes after the 2008 crisis. And because of the Hungarian electoral system, very different from the Dutch, is highly majoritarian. So if someone gets, let's say, 45% of the popular votes, can get a constitutional majority. If a party can get 33% of the popular votes, can get a, um, an, a majority uh, already. So this is highly disproportional. It's very easy to big win in Hungary. And Orban was the person who used this opportunity in 2010 to change all the rules, so now it's even easier for him to, to, um, 
to win and win and win again. So there is lots of lots of learning point, and maybe we can discuss this a little bit. But something I learned when I came back to politics in 2012, that we really know very little about who we are, how our people who, who we, we are talking are, and how important beyond freedom a lot of other things are for people. So freedom is important. It's essential. It gives us, it contributes our identity. Uh, you probably can recall what you were thinking earlier. It really enables us to be who we are. Gives us free choices. Uh, be whoever we want to be. Well, under certain circumstances. But first of all, we all want to be you know, in, in safety. We like some kind of order. And now I understand much more than before about how many Hungarians felt in the 90s when I was in my early years, I, and I had really, together with my whole generation, the, the sky you know, uh, as a limit. People want to avoid threat. We just don't like to live under threat. And it's very, very crucial. It's, it's a core value of every human being. It's not only for the traditionalist. Of course, for some people, some people bear instability better, but a lot of people just really not. And they are still very fine people. So fairness and justice is really important, but security, order, and authority is very, very important for a lot of people, and rightly so. So when we want to uh, bring good politics or we want to really speak about what is happening, we have to think about what people who are not like us think and what is important for them, especially if we want to be successful politicians. So the thing is that, of course, this is not very easy to do, uh, but that's task. So I think it's quite challenging, but still spectacular. Politics is wonderful. So anyone who is, who is the, you don't need to be a politician to think seriously about these things, because it's a collective work. And well, Cutting can tell me or not, but you know, um, politicians on their own will not be able to solve all the problems our societies are facing in these days. It's just so complicated. So we need help, you know, thinking people, freely thinking people. So it's a collective work. And of course, we are not good enough to do so because uh, populists are still winning because they tell something easy. And of course, nothing is easy of, of all the challenges that we are looking for. But this is intellectual, super interesting. So we are here and ready to help each other. Well, thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you uh, very much. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, let me introduce uh, Kati Piri first. Um, welcome. Also, very happy uh, that you are joining us here. You were also here last week yes. uh, for the start of the political debates. On a weekly notice, I'm yes. here. Yes, <laughs> so good to see you. Um, you were born in Hungary. You grew, grew up in the Netherlands, and you uh, joined the Dutch Labour Party, and you served also as a member of the European Parliament from 2014 up to 2021. And uh, you became a Dutch parliamentarian. And in Brussels, you focused on foreign affairs, and you were also member member of the European Parliament Intergroup on LGBT rights. And um, yeah, thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, can I get a short reaction on the the, the, the lecture of the short uh, reaction? Yes, just the well, first impression. No, I think Shuja, uh, what you did was give a, um, a very a very good overview of. Um, uh, how a lot of people in Hungary in very different ways experienced the whole transition and, and how that was obviously also a cause uh, for, for where we are now in Hungary. And there I always think the European Union also had some responsibility in that, you know, in how we are actually doing the whole enlargement process. In Hungary, it really didn't matter in those years before a country 
joined the European Union, whether you had a left or right wing government, you know, the rules from Brussels were exactly the same. So if you thought the transition was going too fast or it was too harsh, and if you voted in another party, well, you know, it was still the same policy that had to come also in, in terms of, of transforming your your whole state and your economy towards the rule of Brussels. And I think that's a lesson that still has not been learned uh, well enough when it comes also to uh, to the Western Balkans. And let's see how we will deal, of course, in the future with Ukraine and Moldova. We'll touch upon this a lot. I want to make it a bit personal first, because uh, when I listen to your story, I also think uh, you... Uh, you say how you know Orban from 1988 and you uh, were in the Fidesz party from uh, the 90s until 1949. So I wonder what was the moment where you thought I need to I need to step out? Do you know something concretely, something uh, what happened? Yes, of course. Uh, I left Fidesz party in 1994 uh, and it was, um, yeah, it's a very painful period of, in my life because, of course, Fidesz was a big love. It's like a first love in everyone's life. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous to say. but So there were a couple of things. Uh, first, um, Orban was elected as party president in 93. Uh, in the first five years, we, we led Fidesz in a, with a buddy. You could see that it was quite a bunch of people. So uh, when he took over the, the leadership, the one-person leadership, he really changed the style and he started to centralize the party. And this is something important also for now because most of these illiberal parties or populist parties are not at all democratic uh, as parties. So this is something also you, you, for you to watch uh, in other countries. Uh, so it, when, when a party becomes very one-man show, that's, that's getting to be a problem. Uh, so um, he, he created a situation very soon that people had to be either with him or not. And I just didn't, didn't want this environment uh, in a political party. So that was, that was her personality question, basically. It's, it's, it started to make a more autocratic leadership. He also believed that Hungary, or Fidesz party with this liberal profile, with this very nice... Uh, like D66 kind of political thing, it doesn't go anywhere. Uh, he looked around in, in Europe, also Hungary had this majoritarian electoral system, so I think he understood that, understood that um, there is no room in the middle, so he should move somewhere. Uh, and because the, the left side of Hungarian politics was, was dominated by the post-communist uh, socialist party, and they were very successful by the mid-90s. Therefore, uh, he thought then on the right side there is more maneuver. And because that was also a kind of uh, momentum, because uh, Jozef Antal, who was the first prime minister, conservative prime minister, he suddenly died from a sickness in 93. So there was a big vacuum. So he, he pulled the party from, from the center, from liberal, to be a conservative party. And uh, this, uh, it was a fascinating uh, time uh, that he created Fidesz from the Fidesz, of the Young Liberal Party, a conservative party within a couple of years. And of course, I, I just didn't want to. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be conservative, but I also didn't like that so many people just changed their minds so quickly. So it was really very surprising. Yeah, and, so and if you look at Orban and your former colleagues and maybe also your friends, doesn't it feel a bit like betrayal? Or does it feel like, oh, no, they're just choosing another political path? So when I left, uh, there was a big, big rupture in the party. So I, I was not on, the only one, but a huge lot of people left Fidesz. So Fidesz went through a very big crisis period in the mid-90s. And basically, um, I would say the liberals left the party and those who remained stayed with Orban, they, they were more fit for, for his party, for his new ideals. And did your former colleagues read your book? Read your book? <laughs> yes, yes. I, I, well, I have some feedback that they, they read and they, they like it, but they don't propagate it because, of course, they don't necessarily agree with me, especially not publicly, that they thought it's a good book. Yeah. Which is very funny. <laughs> and the last it was not, it's not Orban, I have to tell you. No, he, he didn't no, contact sure. me saying that, oh, my secret. <laughs> it's a, but like other people who, who are more, most of them are not very active in the front line. 
but somewhere still in, in Fidesz mm-hmm. environment. And the last personal question and also about Orban himself. Do you think, um, if you think about the Orban from 1988 uh, and the Orban you know now, like was he always that person or did he also made like a kind of a character change? Like do you think he always had this in his mind, like this grab for power and changing the system? So first of all, I think being on power for so long is just not good. Mm-hmm. I I remember when I left in 94, I was 28 years old that time. So I was a veteran, at, which is really funny. But um, I remember that a lot of friends from my university, uh, they started to meet me again. And they said, oh, how nice that you are not in politics any longer. You are just a nicer person. So... Uh, which, which That's not weird. typical for Hungary, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think it's not. No, of course not. So uh, yes, yeah, so it's a role. It's a role being a politician. It and if you are in for many years and you 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 do important decisions, you you just believe that you are such an important person, which is of course, and other people also look at you like you would be an important person, whether it's true or not. So, uh, but of course, Orban was uh, always very um, determined. He was very persistent. He was very strong-minded. Uh, he is very smart. He was very smart and he's still very smart. He's very, very pragmatic. He's not very many um, deep values that he's following. He's super, I think he's rather cynical. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that we didn't see that. But but he was he was a strong personality and he was very determined and he was really looking for power. Mm-hmm. I think the first clashes, the very first debates, I really learned that, oh my God, politics is not about ideals like we thought back then, but is it about something else? And uh, he knew, he always knew that. I think everyone should know that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we all we all heard. Um, in your speech, you also ask yourself what um, freedom means, and you also say it's it's different f- uh, for different people. Uh, so also, uh, if 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 you see what Orban says, he also says he's in favor favor of freedom, of sovereignty, of of of, of independence. And I actually wonder. Uh, Kati, as a politician, how do you deal with this? You, you know, when you are um, in conversation with uh, policymakers from uh, states such as Hungary, how do you deal with these these different views on what freedom or what certain values mean? Well, I mean, obviously, as a Dutch politician, I'm not so much in um, in debating with uh, Hungarian Fidesz members. No, but maybe, sorry, maybe on the it, period you were... Uh, yes, but when I was in, in, in the European Parliament... Um, I had some some Fides colleagues with who I sometimes uh, uh, discussed, and f- funnily, in a way, whenever you're private with them, or at least with two of them, you know, then they really tone down their rhetoric. So it's like we don't really believe that, and uh, so that's one. And I remember one episode which was to me so strange when I was giving a speech uh, in the European Parliament about mm-hmm. Hungary. Uh, and I announced about the illiberalism. Then it was Sayer, who was the leader of the uh, Fidesz faction, who said, well, you're a socialist. How can you be for a liberal democracy? And I thought, oh my God, he has no clue about the concept of liberal democracy. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, no, but, but it almost became like a slogan. Like, if you're a social democrat, how can you be in favor of a liberal democracy? So it, 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 it sometimes comes to, well, I, f- I find the debate, not even with politicians, but my parents are originally from the countryside in Hungary. And whenever I came to the village where my father or another village where my mother grew up, um, I was also a member of the Civil Liberties Committee. It's called the Libe Mm -hmm. Committee, which in Holland, no one knows. But in Hungary, everyone knows. So I was walking through the village and then an old friend of my father comes and he says, you are in the Libe Committee and you voted against Hungary. I said, oh my God, this is like on a 24 hour basis on national television, Mm -hmm. where to even start the discussion when you have been at the countryside where there's no other media than the public TV, which we all know is completely dominated by Fidesz propaganda, where to even start Mm -hmm. the discussion Mm -hmm. 
about politics. Um, so it's very difficult. And I hear you say, Akati says he had no idea about what a liberal democracy is. I hear you say, no, he does. Yes. So is course. he using this or how would well, you characterize this? this? The illiberalism is a built up story. So someone like Sayer, who is a, who is a very smart and very well trained uh, lawyer, who wrote probably one of the first mo uh, memorandum himself. You know, On iPad, then. he changed the constitution. Well, that's a different, that ah, was okay. much long okay. <laughs> later, but in 1988. Yeah. I mean, he was he was uh, one who was putting together this very liberal memorandum. And then 20 years later, he was one who was changing the Hungarian constitution. And I was wondering a lot what, how how they changed their mind and why. And they really believe that the word is changed. And it was valid back then, but we are in different times. Uh, the West is not is not really good, looking good. So if we want to thrive, you know, then we really have to look around in the rest of the world. And it's a funny, but Orban's name is about like Victor, right? I tell you a story because his father is called Jozo, but Jozo in Hungarian means Victor. But the even funnier thing is that he has a brother who is called Jozo. So his father, who is called Victor, like Jozo, has two children out of three who are called Victor. So you can... so Very confusing. <laughs> we, we also have a, a name like Victor, which yes. is... And the Hungarian version called... Yozo, ah, which okay. is means, yes, which yes, means yes, yes. literally okay. like Victor. Yeah. So there is plenty of Victors in that family. And he wants to be a Victor. So he wants to be victorious. It's, uh, uh, I think he, he believes he was born and he's called Victor because he should be victorious. And if it's not the West who is looking good, then he should look on the world and see where he can win because he is a victor. So it's a bit of a funny thing, but I deeply believe that this is what they think. They want to be the winning part of, of, the, of the world history. And they believe that Europe is not doing good. And this is something very important because this is what influences a lot of other people. You know, it's, um, we are in the heart of Europe here and Kadi was in the European Parliament for many years. And uh, it is a big question today where Europe is heading. And Orban is playing a different uh, experiment, I would say. And he's still not convinced that Europe is the best choice. Uh, and of course, we can talk a lot about the corruption and all this oligarchic uh, system, what he built over the last 13 years. But I think the reason how they think, how they convince themselves that something what they said 25 years ago is not valid any longer, because they convince themselves that the world has changed so much, so they have to look for different tactics. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's the story behind someone like Sayer, who was really a mindful, smart person. But, but the question is, what's their goal? And I'm convinced that it's Viktor Orban's goal is to remain in power and to make a lot of money together for his family and his friends. So to me, it's not so much an ideology. You know, I mean, of course, you have to find a way to justify it perhaps for yourself or for the outside world or a story to tell to people. But in the end, it's a power grab. It's not about values. I don't think it's about values, but mm -hmm. Zuzha knows them much more. No, but, but to I'm me, not talking uh, no. about that. They, yeah. they don't think it's values. It's about where... Interest. Uh, where interests are and where they can enrich themselves. And of yeah. course, they say the country, but it's, it's a very uh, oligarchic mm -hmm. uh, political uh, elite now in Hungary. So when they speak about the country, obviously they speak about themselves. This yeah. is what the, one of the biggest problems for me as a Hungarian, because when Orban says that in the name of Hungarian, I just contest what you say, Kati Piri, then he never speaks in my name, right? But he, he pretended, and, and this is what he can present. And actually, many populists who speak in the name of the people, mostly they speak of their own power interest, but they can pack it in a way that they can really sell it well. well. It, most people buy them, or not most, but many, many people buy them. I just want to read a quote from um, Orban, because you also mentioned the Hungarian uprising in uh, 56. And 
Last week it was the anniversary and Orban made a comparison between the Soviet Union and the European Union. Maybe you read it also in the news. And he said, fortunately, Brussels is not Moscow. Moscow was a tragedy. Brussels is only a bad contemporary parody. We had to dance as Moscow whistled. Even if Brussels whistles, we dance as we want. And if we don't want to, we don't dance. Yes. How do you listen to this? Well, this is a, it's a bit boring because he's saying this for a while. So mm -hmm. it's, no, it's not very new to me. This is a, but this is a, a leading narrative, what Orban is telling. This is what he calls his sovereignist politics, that we are not following anyone else's um, the guidelines. Actually, there was a very interesting thing, and how, how much it's not only Hungarian thing, but also an Eastern thing is that in 2004, when we joined uh, many countries uh, to the EU, uh, it was actually uh, Yaroslav Kaczynski who said publicly, OK, now we are in. Finally, we can, uh, we can be whoever we are. So this long negotiation process, which, was ha which preceded the accession, when we really joined the EU, mm -hmm. namely we, uh, our countries joined the, the uh, Acquis Communautaire, so the, the European regulations and, uh, and law, uh, m many people felt that this was act not very natural, but they were not super happy. It, it's also symbolic that we are in now, finally. You, you guys, you, want, you, wa you wanted us to do what you, you, it was necessary, now finally we are really just... And this is... To me, it was always a question, okay, but who we are in this game, you know? And this is, of course, never really defined. So what does this mean when he's saying that we are dancing as we want? It's nothing, right? No one knows how we dance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, it's all very, very symbolic. And you can fill it with whatever you want. It basically means I get a free hand and I do whatever I want. This is what this means. But it told in a nicer story. It's, it's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of things like... And probably you you can uh, hear this also in this country that we want to live in, in we want to maintain our our life or our lifestyle our way of living our way right? of living yeah. so what is our way of living right this is also a kind of catchphrase anyone can fill it with whatever exactly what we dance how whatever we want so it doesn't mean anything it's super it sounds super cool and anyone can basically fill it with any kind of maybe nasty uh, content. So these, these are very, uh, and I think it's in interesting to learn these phrases because these are coming up wherever uh, by all kinds of populists. You also uh, touched upon uh, corruption, which actually increased after uh, Hungary came into the European Union. And uh, Kati, if you look at the funding, at the subsidies from the European Union to Hungary after its, its, its accession, there are also people who say that the European U Union actually enabled Hungary to become more autocratic, not maybe with that intention, but because of all the money flow. How do you, what would you react to this? Well, I would say it's uh, the Hungarians' responsibility, first mm -hmm. of all, to, 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 and also to, to make it undone in a way. Um, but still, uh, were we maybe naive? Na we, like the European Union? Well, in, in many ways, not just, not just with the money. Let's be fair, until the day of today, although part of the funds are now frozen, Hungary is netto the highest receiver of EU funds, you know, from all the 27, uh, 27 member states. So, and actually, I, if I'm not mistaken, but Zuzsa, correct me if I'm wrong, I think 7 or 8% of Hungarian GDP is EU funding. Well, not any longer. Well, but. now not with the frozen money, but mm -hmm. up until a year ago or before it was frozen. I mean, there's not a single country where EU funding is such a big part of your uh, of your uh, gross income as a country. Um, I, I think there are many reasons. Uh, obviously, when you change your economy from a communist economy to a free market economy, and when the money starts flowing in. That's when corruption came in. That's where a lot, a lot of people became incredibly rich. Mm -hmm. And the most part of the people became incredibly poor. 
And uh, if, if you don't have policies, and this is what the EU has always been lacking, in my view, any social policies mm -hmm. in the whole are key when it comes to youth unemployment, when it comes to... Uh, when it comes to building a safety net, right, when you become unemployed, these are not in the rules of the EU key when you're negotiating. And, and if, so if you have pure, pure market economy without any, you know, um, um, any ways of, of softening for those people who fall mm -hmm. out, uh, uh, I mean, you could see it in Hungary. When, when we drove to Hungary every single year, four times a year. My father was a history teacher, so he had four times a year holidays, and we always drove there. In 88, you could see four types of cars, which was the Trabant, the Skoda, the, the, the Wartburg. Uh, and, you know, after 89, my cousin, who, who started working for a Western company, earned six times more then my other cousin, who was a teacher, and they both finished university, and the one was still driving in the, uh, in the Wartburg, and the other one had a BMW. And, and immediately the life of a lot of people changed mm -hmm. drastically. So yes, when suddenly money flows in, corruption is there, and we saw this not only in Hungary, but we saw this unfortunately in many, many Central mm -hmm. European countries. And if you look at what can be done, you know, the, the title of the program is Fighting Authoritarianism. If, if speaking of cutting money flows, uh, as is happening now with the, the frozen subsidies, is, like, is this measure working? What, what, yeah. what do well, you let's see? see how long the EU keeps it up. I already mm -hmm. am afraid that by December a lot of those money might be unfrozen. I'm very concerned about that because you need Hungary in the way that we are functioning in the European Union Viktor Orban is now threatening, of course, to again block the budget uh, uh, negotiations. Uh, and Hungary has a veto. And every time he's playing with the veto, the other countries or the commission starts getting nervous. And I'm not sure how long we are actually going to cut the funding. On the other hand, it also serves his story, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're looking as an autocrat for the other, the other who you can blame for your misery, he found a way in blaming the European Union for your misery by cutting mm -hmm. the funds. So I think what would be a much smarter way, uh, you know, in the Hungarian local elections, a lot of opposition politicians won elections in bigger cities, including in Budapest. But they don't get the money from the central government. So, for instance, in my region, there's an opposition politician who became the mayor of a mid-sized mid mm -hmm. uh, city. All the central funding has been cut off. So the only way he can in have some income is by raising the price for the parking. Well, you're from Amsterdam, so you know how, how <laughs> nasty that can be, the parking price. Mm -hmm. You don't become a very popular mayor, right, if you are, ri if you are raising the parking price, uh, because that's the only income that he can generate by himself because he doesn't, because he's not from Fidesz, he doesn't get mm -hmm. any money. And here the EU could be much smarter. A lot of the funds should not be centrally given, but should be given much Local. more regions mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the city. Would you agree? So I, I think If we're that, thinking about the way how to, yeah, to stop or how to... I think uh, this, in this sense, uh, the European Union is learning a lot in the Hungarian case, I would say. So the, the money question... Uh, and corruption uh, was uh, always notorious issues in the European Union because it is free money. Mm -hmm. So it's a moral hazard. And we, it's a fantastic opportunity for poorer countries uh, to get uh, a, a significant support. It's not only Hungary, but most countries have uh, like a significant three, four, five percent of GDP coming from EU money. It's, it's an incredible contribution, financial contribution, just purely by its volume and, of course, how, what you can do with it. So, and the EU never really looked after how this money was spent. So there, it was always a bit of a, a, a big risk in, in all other southern European countries uh, are also notorious for, for corruption. And and this, this is also demonstrating the, the pr nature of the European Union. You have to agree, all of you, to make, uh, you know, for example, stricter rules. Mm -hmm. I think it's 
EU decision makers are aware for many, many years, not because of Hungary, because of the the moral hazard of the, the free-flowing lots of money. But uh, there was never enough political will to make a stronger control uh, around this. Now, no one so far uh, built autocracy from corrupt money. So this is what Hungary made as a I mean, not, I, I have to say not Hungary, but let's talk about Viktor Orban, right? Which was not all Hungarians. Uh, so this is, this is a kind of completely new situation that a country's leadership or political elite is not only significantly stealing the money, but actually building a different system out of this, which is a security threat for the essence of the European Union. And this is, this is what I think came very, very late, but it's too late, so it not make sense to, to speak about that. Uh, this this recognition, uh, the the European Union, so the withdrawing a fund from the Hungarian government is not just one thing. There are now the European Public Prosecutor's Office, which so there are a couple of new things. There are all, also a rule of law report. So since that, since an, I, I would say that. For a couple of years, uh, there was thinking about what to do with the situation, and the EU has made significant steps forward. I would say it doesn't really help hung on Hungary any longer. It's more to contain other countries. I think, for example, I think Poland, mm -hmm. uh, which is far less problematic than, than Hungary, uh, it was an important element in the hand of the opposition when they, they won. They could see that we, we could get very far. So as a containment it for other countries, it's interesting. And also, of course, a big, big question for the um, f with the best Western Balkans uh, or negotiating with Ukraine. So these are things which now are in the considerations of, of EU countries. For Hungary, it doesn't do it. It's, I mean... Mm -hmm. The, the thing is that Orban is not just um, uh, building uh, this, this uh, autocratic uh, system, m mean, meaning that one party and its elite is getting also... Uh, so it's also a business elite. It's not only a political elite, but they build up an entire system uh, of business elite which is living on the money from the central budget. Uh, through um, state commissions. So these are companies which are where wouldn't stand a day on their own as, as, as private companies. They all live from the government commission. So that, the thing is that that is something new. And then the, the corruption, there is not very easy to catch the corruption in Hungary because in Hungary everything is legal. So there is a law about everything because this government has... Um, a constitutional majority. They make legislation of everything what they want. P plus, they captured all the institutions. So there is no any institute in Hungary like, let's say, the public prosecutor, the constitution court, uh, the the president, or uh, the competition authority. These are all led by Orbán's loyalists. So these institutions of checks and balances exist but they don't function. So this is also the illiberal thing, that you basically nominate a bunch of people, and you, we can see Trump is doing this. Of course, he won't be so successful because it's a more sophisticated political system. But with the small centralized, rather centralized countries, you can do it relatively easy. So that's, uh, this is, um, this is, it's, it's really a perfect learning process. And of course, it doesn't answer the question how to live with Orban. Uh, within the European family because he is remaining there as a challenge because he is vetoing, uh, he's using uh, all the veto rights uh, uh, Hungary has for his own purposes. I wouldn't say that it's my purpose, it's his purpose, uh, but it's, um, it's, it remains uh, to be a challenge. Um, let's touch upon domestic politics for a bit more. The theme of our festival this year is uh, how LGBTQ plus rights are under attack. And in 2021, a law was adopted that banned homosexual and transsexual propaganda uh, in Hungary. What was the impact of that law? So this is a very interesting question because no one, let's say five years ago in Hungary was talking about this kind of things mm -hmm. at all. 
So I was a member of parliament when something around the gender, the term gender, which doesn't even have a Hungarian translation. So it was called like in English and no one understood what it was. And suddenly this guy with the mustache from 1988, who is now the speaker of the parliament, super traditional, very uh, arrogant person, uh, he started to be speak about gender as a threat. And I really was surprised because I was representing um, I, I wanted the Hungarian government or the parliament to support the Istanbul Convention, which is the convention Hungary signed but not ratified. It's a Con Council of Europe convention against violence against women. And I just didn't understand what's the problem with this convention. It's a civilized convention, right? We all want that people, women at home are not beaten and so on and so on. And then it turned out that in the preamble of this convention, there's a word like gender. And they understood that this term gender is too liberal. And it means that basically anyone can be anything. So it was how it started. Uh, and I'm just telling the story because it was so nonsense. Mm -hmm. So but if you look at the daily lives of Hungarians, the, the, did this law have any impact? Well, the law or? came a couple of years later. Mm -hmm. But by the time, there was a Hungarian constitution uh, amendment, just in brackets. Fidesz has changed the Hungarian mm -hmm. constitution in 2011. And ever since, they changed their own constitution 11 times. So uh, this is how stable the Hungarian legal system, that the constitution is basically changed every year. So one of these changes was one sentence which says, the mother is a woman, the father is a man. This is how it started, that they put the gender agenda on, on the public, part of a public discussion. And they build up within a couple of months an, an entire anti-gender ideology propaganda against something which did not exist in Hungary as a problem. So, and this is a very strong um, fight now for something which is a completely made up story. Uh, Hungary, compared to the Netherlands, is a bit more traditional. I would say that in the public opinion, most people accept um, uh, homosexuality. This is not such a big issue any longer compared to, let's say, 20 years ago. But uh, the queer and trans question, this is relatively new. And it's not without reason that, that this government on this propaganda targets specifically only these issues, because in this sense, the majority of the society is still questioning. It's, it's just too new, I would say. Uh, so the, the thing I'm telling this, because it's, it's a sen very sensitive issue in, in this country, because it's on the public agenda, no, it's part of normalcy. Uh, but it would be also in a, quite a normal scene, Hungary. But there is no a political agenda made out of this. And this is something which is a column, completely global phenomenon. It is part of the far-right global agenda. It, is, it came from completely out of blue in Hungary. People do not even understand what gender means still today. And this is where it's everywhere in Eastern Europe and everywhere in Europe. And there are in each country parties which put this on the agenda. And it is a part of a global uh, radical right culture war. Mm -hmm. So this is how it looks like. And of course, it threatens uh, the life of m probably not the life, but some got very inconvenient to, to LGBTQ people. And of course, very much against that kind of liberal way of our way of life, you know, how we would like no people to, to live uh, normally. Kati, you must also see this in Europe, but also in the Netherlands. Yes. How do you respond to this? Well, it's true. It's everywhere. This is not only a Hungarian phenomenon. Uh, we also see it in mm. the Dutch parliament. Uh, there are, I would say, three parties already in the Dutch parliament who have really jumped on this agenda. Um, uh, both uh, PVV, Forum for Democracy and DENK, all three of them in the in the last one, two years, you you see them, uh, I mean, Denk published last week their party program, uh, their party program mm -hmm. where this is one of the key issues. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a way of, of distraction as well. 
Um, and of course, it's disgusting, and it's it's extremely extremely frightening mm -hmm. for for LGBTQI people, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to to have these forces. I mean, you saw it, of course, with Trump coming up as well in the United States and what it brought about. What it brought about. And they're trying to, to, I have a feeling, of, of course, the biggest fear in Hungary, this is the government, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like a fringe opposition party, it's the government, which is the ruling party, which, which is doing this. In many other countries, like in Holland, thank God, it's not the ruling coalition where these, uh, where these uh, narratives are coming from. And let's hope in the US it won't come again, but... Uh, there, I have the feeling it's a kind of, of division because a lot of people are, are in every country are fed up with politics. They don't trust the political system. Um, like Zsuzsa, I think, very well said at the end of her, mm -hmm. of her speech also, a lot of people want more security. It's about, you know, their living, about the housing, about wages, all these issues. We all know Fidesz and Viktor Orban is not delivering on them, you know, a large part of the Hungarian population is living under the poverty level. If you speak to Hungarian teachers, it's a horrific, horrific state of the educational system. If you speak to people in hospitals, and these are the core fears of Hungarians as well. And then what Viktor Orban gives them as the real threat is transgender people. Because then people don't ask him, and what do you do for us? If I go to the hospital, will I get the care that I'm entitled to? If my children go to school, will they be able to have a, a diploma with which you can actually, mm -hmm. you know, continue to study somewhere? Um, and it's a distraction mm -hmm. policy, which... Uh, people buy. Which yeah. people unfortunately buy. Um, and, and it's very, very harmful mm -hmm. for all kinds of minorities. They don't only do this with trans people, they do this with women, with minority groups, with Roma people, for instance, in Hungary. Um, it's something mm -hmm. the populist and the far-right movement all around the world is using. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of questions, but I also am very curious about the audience. But before I go, I, we open up the conversation. I want to, um, yeah, uh, maybe end with something a bit more hopeful, like where are the opportunities if we're talking about fighting authoritarianism or just uh, we, we talked about these EU measures but that's that's just one thing where, where do you see opportuni opportunities um, on how to deal with uh, Hungary and its road on authoritarianism so as I said in this uh, awake uh, you know woke up woke and woke uh, picture mm -hmm. of Orban Orban's agenda is not hungry any longer. He does have hungry for now. Um, but the question for him is how strong he can be on a larger stage. And he is a very good alliance builder. So the fact that uh, American uh, radical right uh, politicians come to Hungary to speak on a CPAC uh, program, which is usually hold by uh, Dallas or Texas, where these these political groups are the strongest in the U.S., and they may get to uh, uh, power next year at the U.S. election. This demonstrates that that he really has very you know far away uh, uh, ambitions, and he's not the only one. So last week he went uh, to the Belt and Road Conference uh, to Beijing. Uh, the only European uh, politician uh, present there, and he met Vladimir Putin at, in a time when uh, Russia is in war and the European Union, including Hungary, supported a lot of sanctions. No one is meeting uh, with Vladimir Putin, and Orban goes to Beijing. So what is this? It's a provocation? Is it a kind of desperate moment for him to to you know, show himself like a strong man because he's so isolated now in Europe. He goes there because he must talk to Putin because Hungary, he created a situation that Hungary is so dependent on Russian gas that he cannot maintain his power if gas prices are higher because this is what actually he promised the Hungarian to keep 
gas price law. So he is in trouble in Hungary because of the, the war. So there, it's, it's very, very confusing, and he's really not very easy situation. So uh, I think there's a lot of leverage in many Western countries and uh, political forces who do not want that autocratic ideals come to position in their own countries to, you know, to think about seriously what to do with the guy because, uh, because he is there and I just do not see many strategies to how to counter him. But it's, mm -hmm. it is an opportunity. So I, I don't think it should be so incredibly difficult because Hungary is a small country. And though Orban is abusing our taxes for whatever he wants, and he you know, it's, it's still, it's, it's, it's very limited and he is in trouble. Hungary is in huge economic crisis. A couple of months ago, uh, the inflation was still uh, beyond 20%. It's, it's still the highest in Europe. This is why actually the, the money is so incredibly important because we are in economic, uh, in economic trouble and it's not because of, we, uh, it's not because only because of the war, but because they abused the money, they didn't spend it you know, they spent it for the election victories uh, a year ago. So there's a lot of uh, opportunity to, to think about more generally how to counter um, aut growing autocracy in Europe. I think it's, um, it's a significant and serious discussion required by all political parties, including conservatives who do not want this happening. And then there must be strategies, concrete strategies against Orban because he is there. He is sitting around the European table and, uh, you know. Concrete strategies, you mean the European Union should take these or? Well, but the, I wouldn't say, I, I don't speak about European Union because there is not such as European Union. I think it's a Europe, it's a European Both political the, elite. Yeah. It's oftentimes the, the national leaders because the European Council is composed of prime ministers. So that's it's the European Parliament is actually doing the best so far. Uh, so it's super important what is coming with the European Parliament election. So we would see more after that, after June, what will be the new setup. It's a real struggle now because there is a very strong cooperation between, uh, well, let's call them populist, but actually autocratic leaning parties together. Orban is supporting everyone in any countries who might be a future coalition partner for him. So this is what we should know. It, he's very conscious, he's very determined, just like 30 years ago, and everyone else should be very you know, determined and very purposeful to, to stop this happening. Opportunities, Kati? Well, I think in Hungary itself, the opportunity are the young people. Mm -hmm. Definitely, and uh, who actually, because a lot of people can't find jobs in Hungary, they are there. Are a lot of Hungarians are living in other EU countries, and they are. Whenever they go back, they see that there's a different life is possible. So that's one. Uh, I think what we should concentrate much more is um, uh, on the countryside, like we also saw in Poland. You know, people in Budapest don't want Orban for a long time. But it's not the people in Budapest who are voting him in. It's the people who feel like left, you know, left alone, uh, who don't get any of the other media. And we saw the same happening in Poland. And thank God we got a different outcome there with the elections. But uh, if you if you don't reach out to to people on who feel they're on mm -hmm. the fringes of society, things will not change. That and, also and means who do you give? This task, like um, well, people first of all, in the Hungary? opposition in yeah. Hungary, mm -hmm. obviously. Uh, although I, I have to say, they are in an incredibly difficult situation. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have a whole state apparatus, uh, all the money of the government is going into campaigning for one single party. Mm -hmm. uh, if they have changed the constitution in a way that it become almost impossible to win elections, if you cannot get any TV or radio um, uh, debate, Orban hasn't been debating for the last 13 years. He didn't have, he didn't have his own election manifesto. So he's not saying elect. You are not because right because opposition parties get five minutes 
every oh, campaign okay. period. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. And this <laughs> is really something. You see, I'm, I'm exaggerating. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So they can win elections. <laughs> uh, well, five minutes. Five but, minutes. But, but, know, but yeah. it's, 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 it's really a desperate situation. <laughs> and I, I wouldn't want to be a politician in Hungary. I, I tell you honestly, because th that's not... That's not the same profession as being a politician in, in, in the Netherlands. It's but still, you say there's a gap they can fill reaching out to this countryside. Absolutely. Yeah. Uniting people. Mm -hmm. People don't feel united. If the teachers are uniting with the students in the election, you know, in, in the cities. in So more solidarity. And what the EU should do, you know, I don't want Dutch taxpayer money to go into the pockets of an autocrat. And I cannot explain, again, with the European Parliament elections coming up, that we will continue doing that. But I can explain that we need to help the Hungarian people. So there need to be different mechanisms. Um, and that means, for once, keep a spine. You know, I, I keep saying to, and, and the European Parliament in that respect is better than the Commission and the Council. Keep a spine. If... Uh, if Viktor Orban is, is, is not changing policies, it means he cannot get the funding. Clear answer. Um, are there any people in the audience who want to ask a question? Please raise your hand and then I'll come to you with the mic. Okay. Thank you for this uh, very insightful uh, uh, story. It, uh, it really helps me to look at it, things from a different perspective. And one of the things I really touched me is how the word freedom can be used so differently uh, across different parties. While we are still discussing how bad it is that, a con that someone like Orban is, um, is destroying freedom, so basically it means that freedom is not the right word to use in discussions anymore because it will misused. Um, do you have any suggestion for an alternative on what the right subject would be to have a, a useful discussion uh, that brings us further? <laughs> wow, that's a very good question. So the, probably, you know, one word, there's no any other one word. I mean, this is a fantastic word like freedom. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether you have uh, in Dutch another word for liberty. Uh, for example, because we use freedom also for liberty, that's, I think, more specific. But we don't have other word in Hungarian, for example. We have only one word, sabacak, which is for everything like this, you know? Even for holidays. Exactly, yes. exactly. Holidays is also, it's mid but you go for, you know, you're free. <laughs> so it's, it's really fascinating terms. Uh, so I, I very much like to think about how you formulate this, this talk, because, because it, uh, it was a big revelation to me um, 10 years ago when that was, a, that was a very interesting moment um, in 2011. So just one year after came, Orban came to power, and he always spoke about freedom, obviously. And there was 15th of March is a Hungarian national holiday. It's uh, remembering the uh, bourgeois revolution of uh, 1848. Did you have a, a revolution, eight, 1848? Like after following You're the asking French me revolution. as a Dutch person? <laughs> 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 you do, you do. So, right? OK. So, Right, so that, that was a kind of follow-up of the French Revolution all over in Europe. So also we had a f fascinating revolution. It was 15th of March uh, of the day in Hungary when it turned out. So typically 15th of March is a big political event we're celebrating. And in 2011, Orban gave a big, big speech. And he was um, telling a poem of Sándor Petőfi, who was a uh, kind of hero of, that, of this uh, 19th century revolution uh, about freedom. And... There was another demonstration uh, where all the opposition and a lot of big movement, one million people for freedom right, freedom right, uh, freedom of media, one million people of freedom for media, called Milla. It was a kind of, it was, it's a fascinating big um, 
uh, demonstration where actually a new party that I later represented started to move. And we also were chanting uh, Petrov's um, poem uh, because, um, because he used in his poems these terms in various different ways. So because the 1948 revolution, and this is something interesting, and it doesn't answer your question actually, but <laughs> but but it's, it has us the, the, that uh, it was 19th century, in the 19th century, um, in this region of, of Eastern Europe, this was a, a double freedom, so the, the national freedom, independence, let's, which we call independence, and freedom rights, liberal rights, uh, were unified. It was, it was a progressive movement. And now uh, everyone is using freedom for, for their... And even terrorists use, right, freedom. So... Uh, it's it's really very complicated. Probably we do not have one word like this any longer to express. It's it's so many shades of of meaning, and it can be politically used and abused so easily that we probably have to find other symbols when we want to express what is really important for us. We also have a freedom party in the Netherlands. Yes. <laughs> and what what kind of party it it's is? It's the party of Mr. Wilders, who's oh, a, that's a, a, who's of a big course. fan right. of... Right. Uh, so you know everything yeah. about this. <laughs> right. Is there anyone else who has a question or a comment? Oh, not more. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question regarding countering authoritarianism. So when you come to a case that like, like Viktor Orban, that an autocrat that already has a very strong hold domestically, like maybe in order to counter authoritarianism, some, some kind of foreign involvement like, or some pressure from the international stage might, might be necessary. But when you were talking about freedom, there is also the freedom from foreign dominance. So I I'm, I'm have a question whether there is a concern about like a stoking some kind of a, a nationalist sentiment um, when there are th that kind of a foreign involvement when it comes to um, countering uh, authoritarianism. And I'm looking at the time, and I see a lot more hands, so let's keep it a bit short, the answers, if you can. Okay, so this is, this is a super important question, and of course, uh, it, um, uh, you know, Orban wants to be so independent. Basically, when he uses freedom, it's kind of his personal independence and autonomy from any kind of foreign power. This is how he uses the term. It's typically from foreign power, this is what he said, that like Brussels is, is like Moscow. That uh, but what he is doing, uh, it's so untransparent that me as a Hungarian political person, I'm not active as a politician any longer, but I really have no idea how much uh, influence certain uh, foreign countries are on us. And uh, because we are so incredibly dependent on, you know, on Russia in various ways, I think we there is a growing dependency on um, uh, Eastern uh, Asian money. Uh, it's not only Chinese; it's also from um, it's uh, South Korean, because the government is involved in so many deals, and everything is secret and hungry for thirty years. So um, it's a it's a it's a significant problem, and I can I cannot really see clearly, and if I cannot, that means that most Hungarians can't. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, I had a question about, um, well, freedom again. Um, so, Orban calls himself a freedom fighter, but at the same time, he calls his system an illiberal autocracy. Like, how does that work and and how do people want to vote for someone who is an illiberal vote for an illiberal system for freedom like i don't i don't see how that works because he's he, he when he says freedom he says that we are free from uh we do whatever we want this is what we mean and this is you know, it's uh, tempting for many people. So we don't follow any other you know rules or guidance we do whatever we want uh, and that's what he means by freedom fighting. You know, it's uh, he's completely changed the the meaning of this term. 
I would say, I would add, very nationalistic in a way. Of course. You know? I mean, he very makes you feel proud as a Hungarian. He stands up for your history. He, uh, you know, he doesn't let foreign powers to interfere with the prideness of Hungary. At least this is how, you know, when I speak with Hungarians uh, who are voting uh, for, for him, uh, this, this is the sentiment that he uh, very much plays on. And I, I always thought, you know, for instance, all, the, all his fight with the judiciary, when he, he was saying, you know, look, the people elected me. And who are these judges? Who elected them to tell you that the politician you elected cannot do stuff? You know, this is the type of populist logic, of course, he's using. So, and then people go like, yeah, sure. I mean, we didn't elect that judge. You know, who is he to decide what are the rules of, of, of you know, it's up to a government who we can elect and where we go for elections. And, well, this is how, how you turn a very fragile young democracy into an autocracy. Last question there, maybe? Yes. Thank you again. Um, I think my question is stemming from one of your questions to um, the two ladies here. Thank you so much for this discussion. Uh, but you raised the question whether or not the EU is responsible for prolonging or increasing the level of corruption by providing this kind of fund for all these years. and. This question made me think of the idea of what is the EU and whether or not we are given this kind of patriarchal uh, scheme that it should have this kind of say about what countries are doing, like Hungary or not. And then um, it makes me think, is the EU the constitutions, the, the institutions that contribute into the EU and it's this regime or is it the countries that are uh, economically doing better and providing for the other less economically developed countries? And from the answers about the hope, it also very vague for me the line mm. where we are giving some kind of power or hope that change is possible from the, within the inside. Like what would Hungary have done if it was not part of the EU? You talked about the checks and balances and you talked about how the system, it was there and there is some kind of hope of change from the within. So this is the where the vagueness and the question for you. Um, where do you see that the EU can um, intervene or that it can go in one of the countries? And what are the criteria? Like, would it do this in Germany or in more economic, more powerful? on topics that are important for the population, like uh, the minorities' rights or the LGBTQ rights or these other things, or is it just an economic, um, um, you got the idea. Mm -hmm. Well, we could make a whole new program about this, this question. Uh, maybe choose a, like a smaller question within this question to answer. Should I start? Yes. Well, I think it's a, it's a very good question, and it's it's exactly what I think. Um, for instance, me as a member of the European Parliament have been struggling with. So, in a sense, of course, countries themselves decide whether they join the European Union or not. And we always say it's much more than just the economic union, right? It's also based on values. But to be honest, the most rules we have in the EU are actually only on economics. So the easiest way to intervene is when there is an economic problem in Hungary, and then we intervene through the economic rules, but it's much more difficult, much more difficult, and this is where we had the whole debate on the rule of law mechanism. You cannot just intervene because there's suddenly a right-wing government somewhere or a very left-wing government and you don't like it, right? Uh, there is no uh, LGBTQI rights which are there for everyone in Europe. This is up to national countries themselves to decide. So the question is always, where are the boundaries? You know, where are the boundaries where, as an EU country, you have to oblige with? And that is, for me, the rule of law you know, uh, uh, free press, uh, so that these 
But unfortunately, we don't have that many rules for that inside the EU. We have rules for how long a banana should be if it wants to enter the European Union, but not about free press. And this is exactly, exactly one of the problems that we need to solve uh, if we also want to enlarge the European Union uh, uh, further. And this is where we always, in the European Parliament, we're looking for ways how to not only look at economic rules, so just, just to give you one example. If I remember correctly, when, um, oh, what's his name again? He died last year, the Italian populist Berlusconi. Berlusconi yeah. When he started eroding the freedom of press in Italy, the European Union had, you know, wanted to intervene. But what they did was by saying, oh, you have three big companies, and you cannot merge them into one because that's against the rules of the EU, e European internal market. It had nothing to do with the thinking about free press. They used the economic rule in order to improve or, or, or stop the worsening of freedom of press. And so this is a big lacoon we have in, uh, uh, in, Europe, in, in the European Union. I don't know how, if you see it the same way, Ruzan. Of course, uh, absolutely. I mean, the first thing is that the EU is a very strange organization, right? So it's, it's, there, there's a, a Hungarian-born uh, uh, American uh, political scientist who says it's a half-baked union. So there are things where we are really united, uh, and it is mainly the economy thing because it started to be like this, and this is how far the political willingness in the European member states went so far. It doesn't contain constitutions. Every, every state is, it's very important. This is also part of the existence of this EU because, because the cultural specificities, including the political uh, structures, uh, are deeply embedded and no, no countries would support to have, you know, unifying the, the EU constitution. So this is how far we got. And this is not, it's not a complete unity. It's not, we are not a United States of Europe and most probably we will not never be. And then we have to live with this. But we are now at an inflection point. And this is what we are struggling. And Hungary is, is interesting because it's, um, we can learn a lot through the Hungary case because Orban came up with so many weaknesses of the EU unity. And we also have this, and this is why I start, uh, try to put Hungary into this global context because Europe is not only challenged from internally, but also by the entire world, it's, it's, it, we are going through a complete reshaping of the, of the globe. And your questions, what the future of the EU, is also part of this bigger question. So we have to, the European Union, and this means 27 uh, very different uh, governments and people, have to find out how to move ahead through this double challenge from inside, from inside autocrats and from the global shift of power. And th these are all combined. And this is why I, th I think that, you know, the European politicians are just not enough uh, for that. It's a larger question than what we can trust politicians to answer. So this is also an invitation for all of you who are thinking seriously. It's an, an academic question. It's for think tanks. It's for intellectuals. And in this country, you have, you know, the free speech. We we also have free speech. I can free speech speak freely wherever I go, even at home. I just have no influence because it will not I be cannot go to the paper. television, even yeah. not for five minutes. So <laughs> that's that's the thing. That so it but it's really a joint effort. It's a, it's a joint effort. It's a big, big work. I think it's fascinating. So I don't think we have to be worried, though it often look very worrying, the situation. But it's just that we go through a big, big change. And uh, if we are aware of that, we can get out the best of the change. We all got some homework to do. Thanks a lot. We have a third round at the bar, so we can discuss there even more. But first, please give them both a great applause. Kati Pir and Shuja Zeleni.
And please, uh, I also want to thank the people who are watching online and please keep an eye on our website for upcoming programming. And for now, I wish you all a very good evening. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.